Um, so yes, appetizers will be served shortly after the. Uh, um, many students want to travel internationally as part of their professional education, and preservation students are rarely an exception. But if all preservation is local, what does that imply for the validity or authenticity of coursework that places students abroad in a learning environment that typically has culturally distinct and unfamiliar resources and clients? I would venture that study abroad is a negotiation between a program that seeks to provide valuable skills and knowledge to its students and a client, whether an individual organization or community that has certain goals and expectations of the process. One key to the success of such a venture then is managing expectations on all sides, students, faculty, the academy, and local stakeholders. While looking briefly at four examples of preservation work with students abroad, I will touch on the perhaps expected questions of appropriate preparation, project selection, and balance between cultural exposure and professional practice. A few caveats. These examples are essentially one-off experiences with unique origins. Programs with a long-term commitment to a single community or region have different opportunities and challenges. Second, in all these examples, the majority of the students were undergraduates and non-preservation majors. Finally, many of these types of programs aspire to come under the rubric of service learning. However, while the students may wish to do good, especially Americans, those types of programs carry additional expectations and cultural baggage that can be problematic in many international contexts. To the question of what was the most valuable lesson learned from these experiences, I would answer the things I didn't expect or plan for. To me, that is also the principal reason for throwing ourselves in some place new and different. I suspect each student would answer that question in his or her own way. So here are four stories about places, projects, and surprises. Lubuka, Fiji, a town of roughly 2,000 inhabitants, is the original colonial capital of the country, dating from the mid-19th century when this group of islands unified and gave themselves to Great Britain in an attempt to escape the depredations of American whalers and others. Um, I became involved because a colleague, Jerry Takano, a preservation architect from Hawaii, had been hired as the heritage advisor for Lubuka. After making a preliminary trip in January 1995 to help Jerry out, I decided that a group of USC architecture students, I decided to bring a group of USC architecture students back with me that summer. The political situation in Fiji was delicate. It was a quiet period in between coups, and in fact, Takano had been put under house arrest upon his arrival until it was clarified that he would only be working with buildings and sites associated with American and European settlement. Lavuka is a self-proclaimed sister city to Lahaina on Maui and had become an important whaling port and then trading site by the early 20th century, even after Fiji's capital had moved to Suva. Lavuka was a designated national resource the only site in the country that was so recognized for its historic character, the others were all natural sites. It was protected under the Bua Charter, whose regulations were enforced strictly. This is where I lived, and that's what it looked like in the 19th century as the British Lieutenant Governor General's house. Lavuka claims many firsts, including the oldest hotel, Masonic Lodge, and public school in the South Pacific. All are still functioning. It also has a wonderful collection of religious structures associated with the Catholic, Methodist, Hindu, and Muslim faiths. The eight students I took with me for a two-month stint in Lavuka included several who had taken my preservation studio. Most had not, however. Our first stop, therefore, was Hawaii, where we joined Bill Chapman and his students at the University of Hawaii for a week on Oahu and Maui, beginning to become familiar with island culture on a Pacific archipelago with imported populations and a sugarcane culture, features Hawaii had in common with Fiji. We also participated in a survey of a township on Maui, an activity we then repeated in Lavuka with Jerry Takano. Besides documentation, we took on two design projects. One was a potential new use for an old cannery on the waterfront. 
The other was how to accommodate increased growth in the shopkeeping families living along the historic Main Street. The problem was the result of a confluence of several factors, not all of them palatable. First, the buildings were designated and therefore rigorously protected, but they were also occupied by primarily Hindu and Muslim families, descendants of workers imported by the British from India in the 19th century, and to a lesser extent by East Asians and a few Europeans. This is typical of towns in Fiji. Essentially, all the land outside these urban settlements is held by Melanesian tribes, the people identified by themselves and many others as Fijians, who also live in these rural areas. Thus, the only place for the roughly half of Fiji's population that is non-Melanesian to live is in the geographically circumscribed towns. And if a town doesn't permit alterations to the existing fabric, this is an example of a Melanesian tribal settlement outside the town. If the town doesn't permit alterations to the existing fabric, then there is a problem. Our solution was essentially to suggest ways to build up in the middle of the block so that there was no visual change to the streetscapes. But the larger lesson was the overwhelming impact of politics and the influences such choices made by a society had on our options and our own ethics and morality. Fortunately, Mavuka was also a rare example in which relations between the various races and cultures was relatively amicable, and so the students were able to make friends across all communities. In 1998, I and a small group of um, architecture and archaeology students from the University of Texas at Austin joined faculty and graduate preservation students from Columbia and Penn working with UT classical archaeologist Joseph Carter on a major Hellenic site on the Black Sea, Kyrsonesis, a town in Cora dating from the 4th century BC at the western tip of the Crimean Peninsula in what was then Ukraine and is now Russia. Uh, while Carter's excavations have been going on for some time, a preservation component was relatively recent. Some of the surrounding landscape, the town, uh, the city of Sevastopol, which is adjacent to um, the Kora. The area is dominated, excuse me, by the town of Sevastopol, which was founded by Catherine the Great in the 1780s as the home of Russia's Black Sea fleet. Sevastopol, a city of 350,000, was destroyed twice, once during the Crimean War and once during World War II, when it was besieged for 250 days, with only four buildings standing by the time the Nazis finally overran the city. In appreciation for tying up the German army for so long, Stalin allowed the city to rebuild essentially as it had been before, at least in outward appearance. The strategic importance of the area was long recognized. And despite the wars, the long use of the area by Russia's military kept the Greek ruins surprisingly intact and free from spoilage, as well as providing a ready supply of cadets to help Russia's archaeologists with their initial explorations. Besides roads, walls, farm buildings, granaries, wineries, irrigation structures, and facilities for oil production and storage, there are even vines and olive trees that can be traced back to the original settlement. Uh, this is some of the military uh, structures on the site, and these are the original Greek uh, buildings, some being as far back, as, as I said, as the fourth century. However, with the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, the area and its inhabitants were plunged into desperate straits. A city of almost 400,000 had lost its main source of income and also the existing socialist network for education, health care, and most critically, food. The result was near starvation and then large-scale usurpation of the archaeological preserves adjoining the city for agricultural land. And here you see gotchas beginning to be set up. And the ancient Greek buildings, walls, and roadbeds became the building materials for these dachas and other agricultural structures. In fact, one of the site's directors tried to intervene to stop this 
when she did, an admiral had to race to her rescue before her car was overturned with her in it by the starving uh, sailors and their families. The preservation students, and this, by the way, so uh, income is produced by people selling the goods that they produce in their farm, in the markets in town, and this is a celebration of the Black Sea Fleet, a, a naval parade um, in the harbor there. The preservation students, led by professors Norman Weiss and Pamela Jerome, were there to document and conserve the architecture that Carter's group uncovered. Besides assisting them, I worked with another student on developing a schematic for a cultural landscape report for the site. The conservation effort was meant literally to cement in place the stones uncovered and then assembled using anastylosis into the floors and walls of the Hellenic farmhouses. These partial reconstructions were then used as the basis for a series of reconstruction drawings that depicted the structures with their missing wood and plaster upper floors and roofs. The conservation work on the buildings described in an article in the APT Bulletin included developing a technologically sophisticated new mortar. It, in turn, depended on ready access to basic cement making supplies such as sand. Unfortunately, the only reliable source of anything was the Mafia, which had stepped in to provide basic services to the area as well as to exploit the chaos after the collapse of the Soviet Union. After trying every legal channel for almost two months to get necessary materials and with time running out, the conservators finally made a phone call to local mafia and the next day what was needed was delivered to the site. A more dramatic and perhaps ominous example of reliance on the mafia, however, came out of the conflicted history of the site. After the Greeks, Kyrsonesus was occupied by Romans and then the Holy Roman Empire before falling to the Tatars around 1300. In 988, Vladimir the Great, the king of the Kievan Rus, conquered Kyrsonesus and then converted to Christianity in order to wed the sister of the Roman Byzantine Emperor, Basil. This event brought Christianity to the Slavs, and so with the end of communism, the Russian Orthodox Church sought to celebrate the site of the event. Importuning Orthodox priests from Moscow, however, were met by resistance from the site's curators, who were both more committed to the classical history and maintained that the actual baptism site was unclear. In addition, at the time, the Moscow Patriarchate was seen as a bit of an interloper since the area was technically in the purview of the Kievan church. This was a 19th century church uh, that was built to celebrate uh, Christianity at that site. However, one night, a black painted helicopter flew over the site and lowered a small metal shrine onto this location where it was bolted into place. The site curators were then informed that if the shrine disappeared, so would all the site's pagan history. In other words, everything before Vladimir the Great. Today, the site is clearly celebratory of the baptism. The Bosnia studio I conducted at UT Austin had a combination of upper class undergraduate architecture students and graduate students in architecture and historic preservation. It was intended to feed into an ongoing 10 year long effort, Mosfer 2004, which was begun by a Bosnian architect, Amir Papic, after the 1994 destruction of the historic bridge in Mosfer, built by the Ottomans in the 16th century, and at the time of its destruction, still the longest single span stone arch in the world. Mosfer is a city of about 110,000 people located on the border between Muslim, Bosniak, and Catholic Herzegovina parts of the country. It was the front line in the civil war for years, first under attack from Serbs and then from Croats. The death and destruction was staggering, and one of the most challenging aspects to reconstruction was that most of the original population of the city fled in the early stages of the war, many to Norway and other communities far from the Balkans, and the population today is largely made up of people who in turn fled to Moscow from other parts of Bosnia-Herzegovina. Each summer, Pasic and the Moscow 2004 organization hosted an international two-week-long workshop 
with up to 80 students and faculty from around the world participating. These were initially held in Istanbul until the Civil War ended and it was safe to hold them in Moscow. Our class is going to participate in the sixth workshop in the summer of 2000. During the prior spring semester, I assigned my students three design projects. The first two were a replacement bridge, an exercise meant to familiarize them with the urban form of the city and the role of the river and its bridges, and a new home for a Muslim family, which was meant to explore the nature of the traditional mahalas, the European form of Islam practice there, and questions of identity and self-expression after the war. The third project was the adaptive reuse of a large 19th century school building. Along with the studio, I organized a lecture series with talks by architects, preservationists, and historians from the US and the Middle East, including John Kalane, Pamela Jerome, Brooke Harrington, Sami Angawi, and Buluangan. I also arranged for an exhibition of drawings and photographic documentation of historic Mecca. Almost all the students made the trip to Moscow, which was preceded by a tour of Zagreb, Split, and Dubrovnik, and followed by a week-long visit to uh, the three Ottoman capitals of Edirne, Bursa, and Istanbul. On arriving in Moscow, we, we found the workshop, however, frustrating because it became clear after a while that it was meant primarily to keep the world's attention on Moscow and its pressing need for reconstruction, and secondarily to give students the opportunity to experience and confront the realities of conflict and its consequences on communities and places. What it wasn't was the kind of professional service that many had arrived expecting to do. The most effective part of the trip, then, occurred during the second week when the students were set free to make up their own projects based on what they had seen and what they each felt they needed to address. This was, in truth, field work as therapy, but also reflected the reality of a 10-year effort running a bit out of steam midway through. Many students just walked onto sites of destruction and rebuilding and asked to help. Others spent days talking to local families about the war and its impacts. Few were able to maintain professional distance or use their design skills. And this is us in Bursa on the way out. The Diggy Project was a result of a desire to visit India by members of an undergraduate student organization at Cornell, MOAP, or the Minority Student Organization in the College of Architecture, Art, and Planning. I have been conducting research on modern architecture in India for several years. Michael Tomlin on traditional architecture there for even longer, and so we were approached about leading the trip, and I took it on. The students wanted to include a service learning component, in part because it gave them access to some more funding. They had to raise the $40,000 required for 12 students to travel to India and then spend three weeks exploring. Through some of my own connections, I came up with a project that seemed reasonable for a diverse group of undergraduates that included architects, planners, artists, and even people from the School of Industrial Labor Relations, a survey and documentation of a small historic town that could be used for the development of a comprehensive plan for the community. Digi is a town in rural Rajasthan of roughly 7,000 inhabitants that hosts up to a half a million pilgrims during an annual pilgrimage in the monsoon season, with an apparently 11th century temple as the destination. The walled town also has a fort complex with structures from the 17th century and later, as well as step wells and many other interesting structures. Two Indian architects were critical to the effort. One was a former student who had accompanied me to Crimea, and although based now in New York, fortunately was in India at the same time as we were. The other was the local architect from Delhi, whose client was the king of the town. Ravi Kaimal of Kaimal Chatterjee Associates. Kaimal had not only identified the project for us, but also helped prepare base documents for the project. Despite several lectures given before we left and claims amongst the students of travel experience, these students were really not prepared for India, especially as it happened, a bitterly cold North India in wintertime. 
As the Moab president admitted to me when arriving at the small, poor, dusty town that was to be the focus of our efforts, I was kind of expecting the south of France, but with saris. In the town, students divided up to document the community, both by geographical area and by topology. They took photographs, made drawings, and conducted interviews with the assistance of translators whose English itself often required translation. Invaluable in all this was the Takur, the king, Ramprasat Singh, who had arranged for a fee, housing and food for us, as well as who also spent time along with his son walking the town and the students, with the students and telling them about the family history. John and Matthew prepared some of the other documentation and then a presentation that we made to the Takur uh, at the end of our week um, work. The immediate results of the trip included an exhibition at Cornell by the students. A follow-up seminar led to the production of material that needed heavy editing and additional research before a 90-page report was issued last year. It was a highly top-down process with an educated professional architect working with the local king to develop the project and receive, and receive the results. The report had several goals, all of which were apparently met. Fred from Lima. First, the team sought to use its outsider lens and naivete to see and comment on things in a way that might reinforce and broaden the sense of what was valuable and worth celebrating and preserving. Next, the team sought to bring a multidisciplinary perspective to understanding Diggy in a way that its limited history of recent poor interventions suggested had been lacking. So we looked at everything from jobs to healthcare to bird life to traditional architecture to transportation to infrastructure. Third, we wanted to provide an attractive document that celebrated the town, which could be used for fundraising and to secure political advantage at the state or national level. In other words, while I was trying to teach some basic preservation planning concepts to the students and fulfill a service learning requirement in a way that advanced their intellectual and professional development, I was also cognizant of needing to provide a piece of political ammunition to a local dignitary offering, operating in a very different social and cultural milieu for many of us. Hopefully, Mr. Singh received from the exchange something equal to the remarkable experiences and lasting memories I and my students gained from the trip. Thank you.